I just had this wonderful podcast with Dr. Shira Leibowitz, and we we're talking about her new book, Havens of Hope, Ideas for Redesigning Education from the COVID-19 Pandemic. And as we were talking, and she has a very interesting story, uh, I asked her what to define the word hope. And one of the things that she said was that she talked about the, the notion of hope being something that's active, not passive, right? And I think that when we talk about the idea of hope, we, we do, <laughs> the hope is that it is actually a passive thing that things will happen to us. And as I, I reflect on the conversation, and I always record these intros after, because I, I like to just kind of sit and think about like, what were my kind of takeaways? It is really kind of reaffirming this notion that we can hope to create something better, or we can hope something happens. And those are different things. And I've always been a big advocate of initiating change, because it's so much easier to deal with when you are the ones to initiate it when you go through the process to actually create that change as opposed to being changed thrust upon you. And sometimes both things happen, right? You're creating change and changes are thrust upon you, but it seems like it's an easier way to navigate. And so really kind of thinking, what is hope, right? And how do you see that word hope? And what do we hope to create? Not what do we hope to happen? So I, I, I really love this, this uh, conversation I had with Dr. Shira. She's someone I've known for a very long time and connected with her through social media years ago. So I hope you enjoy it too. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am very blessed today to have Dr. Shira Leibowitz on the podcast. And I've known Shira for a very long time. We connected years ago through Twitter and uh, we, we just started talking and connecting again. Uh, she actually has a new book that's coming out in it's scheduled for August of 2022. Uh, it is called Havens of Hope Ideas for Redesigning Education from the COVID-19 Pandemic. And what I love about this and when you know, we we're just kind of talking, prepping for the podcast before is that this idea of like redesigning and creating something is not something that Shira actually probably had, you know, after the pandemic. That's part of it. But this is actually uh, based on our learning from creating a new uh, child care center called Discovery Village in, in New York, just outside uh, Westchester. So you were creating before we were kind of pushed to create, which I, I love, right? Because I'm, I'm a big advocate that the best change that you can go through is the one you initiate yourselves. And you, you seem to have done this. So uh, Shira, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for joining me today. If you can just tell everyone a little bit about who you are, what you do today and how you got there, that'd be a, a great way to start. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's so much fun to see you again and to be here. I appreciate. Uh, I'm an educator. I'm a career educator. I spent 20 years as a principal of pre-K through eighth grade schools and, and loved it. And at a certain point, um, became more and more enchanted with the early childhood space because uh, we've been talking for years about changing education. And I became enamored with project-based learning and pulling what the great early childhood approaches do at their essence up into the K to eight space. And at a certain point, uh, I had done this for a long time and I really wanted to work for myself and to be able to create what I imagined. And I love the early childhood space and that's a space where there are independent programs. So I opened the center in July of 2019 and it is designed as a play and project-based program deeply grounded in Reggio-inspired learning, which is significant in terms of what comes later and what happened during the pandemic. So I opened and was building it up and it was going well. And then March 2020, we all know what happened. Right. Um, so, yeah. So I found myself just north of New York City, um, one of the first and worst COVID hotspots in the country hmm. and classified as an essential business and encouraged to stay open. So we did. And the center has a capacity of 128 students. We dropped overnight to six students and we, we were committed to figuring it out. We came up right. with COVID health and safety protocol three months before New York state did. There were a number of early childhood educators programs that were open because we were deemed essential. So we were figuring all of this out while the K to 12 space was figuring out online remote learning. It was different kind of intensity. Mm -hmm. And that 
sparked a lot of conversation about what's possible here. And we looked back to programs past that were born in crisis and wondered, are we standing at the start of something new? Could we be standing at the start mm-hmm. of something new? And that inspired the book. I, I felt in my, in my bones that I, I wouldn't remember the intensity of what it was. I wouldn't be able to bring, my back to, bring myself back to that place mm-hmm. and wanted to write about it and interview people and experience it with others who were not only navigating through, but were getting better and transforming into something better in real time. And so that's the story the book traces, the stories the book traces. Well, we're going to, we're going to get into this a little bit more, but I got to ask you a few questions. The, when you, you, so you were a principal for quite a while, is that correct? 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. You've been, you've been in principal. So like, I, I've talked to a lot of people about, you know, starting their own, you know, schools, their own childcare centers, things like this. What are some of the things that you learned as a principal, as an administrator in a school that help you become like a founder and a CEO? Like, are there, there, are there a lot of things that, you know, that transferred easily over there? Were there things that you had no clue what you were doing at that point that maybe you didn't have that skill? Like, what are some of the things that you saw were, you know, very uh, beneficial to you in your career to start this place? And what are some, some of the new things that you had to learn? So much transferred. There was such a strong foundation to move into running my own school from having run schools. Mm. The educational piece, for sure. The coaching of teachers, the hiring piece, for sure. The knowing how to connect with others when I don't know something, because we've known that. Principals need that. So to not be afraid to have people who you turn to for advice to know that you need that. Uh, to not be afraid to ask questions, to not be afraid to figure stuff out, to not be afraid of the messiness because schools are messy and businesses are messy. It it, it flow it honestly it flowed and talking to people through the pandemic who made that leap because the possibility emerged to them when they hadn't realized before starting schools when they had never thought about starting schools it's doable. And it's a message that I would love for any principal or any educator listening right now. There are so many ways to start your own program. If that is what you want for yourself, if you're passionate about it. Right. And, and th- like, I actually, one of the things I really appreciate is that when we connect with people and this is something that I really embraced and was taught in my own career and, you know, embrace myself is that it's really important to connect with people who, as you kind of alluded to, know things that you don't, right? And a lot of times we can get really caught up in this trap, especially when we're hiring, that we hire clones of ourselves. But I don't need a clone of myself, right? Because I already got me. I understand that. I need people that think different, have different experiences, uh, and maybe weirdly enough, appeal to different people, right? And like, you know, you know, maybe like some people feel more comfortable talking to me than they would, you know, uh, my vice principal and vice versa. And I think that's a, something that's really powerful. So what what were some of the things that you weren't prepared for in this process? What was like kind of shocking to you? What was something that was like a new process that, you know, if anyone's, maybe you can help uh, the people that are maybe inspired to maybe start something of their own like this. What w- like what was something that, you know, you, you had no idea was, was happening? Um, HR in a really deep way. So, Right. They're, they're, uh, and, and this is in addition to who you hire, the consultants that you have who you don't hire, but you pay to support you. So having an HR consultant, mm. um, a ter- a HR consultant, attorney, accountant, all of those, those right. kind of folks that you can't afford and don't need full time. But to have as consultants is really vital. Um, there's a lot of state law around labor law, and uh, many states, New York included, are much friendlier to employees than employers, as mm-hmm. makes good sense. Um, but you can easily be non-compliant without realizing it. And right. so living in integrity and doing things appropriately and making sure there were people looking over my shoulder to help me do that was really vital and was really new. Um, being personally responsible for payroll and, and supporting Mm. people. Um, so, you know, as a principal, there was a budget, I was responsible for the budget, but here it's me. And during the challenging days of COVID, when at first I didn't want to furlough anybody, 
Um, I didn't get the Paycheck Protection Plan loan, the loans to support um, payroll the first time around. I did the second time around, but but after I didn't get it the first time, I, I furloughed everybody only for six weeks. But hmm. up until that time, um, enrollment had dropped to six. I wasn't charging people who weren't coming. Um, payroll was coming out of my own savings. And that wow. sense of responsibility for um, caring for others and knowing that it's it's you was a big shift and a, a mindset shift. So in time, it, it became, um, I'm able to create an environment where people can thrive and, and what a gift and what a blessing. Well, it here's was the, hard to adapt. Yeah, go ahead. Well, here, here's, here's what's interesting about what you're saying. And I think there there is... Um, people always talk about like, Oh, we don't need managers. We need leaders. I'm like, mm, you kind of need both. Right. Like, cause you have this vision for what you're trying to create, which is very important, but you actually have to do the management of it. You actually have to put things like you can say like, oh, I want to create this one of this, but then you have, you know, HR issues. Then you have payroll issues, right? That is the management part of it too. So it's not an either or it's a both because I think that's where it's really crucial is that you have to understand like, Hey, I, I have a vision of the things I want to do. But I actually have to put people in place. I have to put systems in place. I have to have, you know, capital, all of these things to be able to support that vision. You know, you can have this incredible vision for where you want to go. But if you don't actually have the management skills to put that in place, it's never going to happen. Yes. And that's, in fact, the uh, professional training program I started to do exactly that. So Hmm. what became evident to me is that a well-implemented vision is the way to have a purpose-driven program. And so it, it clicked in my mind. It's an easy-to-remember formula, VIP, vision, implementation, and purpose. And, and that's the training. And the vision in my mind and what came out of what I understood from programs navigating through COVID mm-hmm. was that vision isn't only about educational philosophy. It's not only about the educational program powerful programs, the the life-changing, field-changing, contributing to world-changing programs are implementing vision into operations, into mm-hmm. human relations, into finance, into facilities, into everything, um, and into marketing. And so that's something when you, you go into a business that a, that a publicly funded program doesn't need to do, and that educators sometimes feel very... Um, uncomfortable with or or even it feels distasteful and so there was a transforming marketing into making a promise and articulating it in a compelling way that then in integrity you have to leave you have to live up to in delivery and so when when all of those things are aligned you have a world-class program yeah and i love that you you know you start with the vision but you have to be able to support it right and so yeah. I think, you know, I think we can kind of maybe go one side or the other too hard. Um, so if I, uh, I, I want to know this, what is, so the, the, the center is called the Discovery Village Child, it's child Care and Child Care Center. Is that correct? Yeah, it's Discovery that? Village Child Care Center and Preschool. So it's a child child care. Care. Okay. So yeah. tell me, tell me, so we've been talking about vision. What's the vision? Tell me about this. Like what's, the, what's the experience that a kid would have, um, you know, and I think it's what, two to five year olds. Is that correct? Six weeks to five. So oh, six the- weeks to five. Six there weeks. You go. To five. Yes, we have the babies. So the vision shifted through the pandemic. The vision okay. began, um, or, or deepened, I should say. So it began as Discovery Village, offering the care of a village, the creativity of an art studio, and the discovery of a science lab. And it was really all about relationship rich. Um, creative, imaginative play and project-based pursuits. Very heavy on the arts and sciences, even from the, the littlest babies. Right. Um, you know, letting them get messy and, and play with materials. So, and that, and that still exists. But during the pandemic, what shifted, um, and it came out in the words Havens of Hope, it became about well-being for people and the planet, um, feeling the need for well-being, physical and emotional during everything that we were going through. Mm -hmm. And and the core values shifted to three values that never had even been on my list in the past and just 
emerged as, as what we needed. So the first was calm. We needed the place to be calm. So there is no chaos. There can be the biggest mess going on behind the scenes. But when you walk through the halls, it, it feels like a spa. There's the soft music playing. It's gentle. Nobody yes, raises their voice, right? It, it, oh, my goodness. It's amazing. Um, and parents come in for tours and 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 will look at us and say, it feels like a spa in here. And we'll right. kind of smile. Well, yeah, yeah, that's what we're going for. Um, and it doesn't mean the kids don't play and get messy and active. Right. But it's with a calm. And that was our way to create a place of hope in the midst of the chaos that was was going on outside. Um caused us to make different choices than a lot of other places. So this is an aside for an example. Um, during the very early days of the pandemic, we were open and uh, most of the world was shut down. And um, most programs were not letting families in because you could spread right. COVID. Right. I remember we were terrified. Like we thought you walked near a person, you were going to die. Right. Um, so uh, a mom uh, comes to the door with her two-year-old and She's an essential worker, was going through trauma. Everybody was stressed. And her and her daughter just both start crying and hugging each other at the door. And I said, you, you come in. And from that moment, I turned to my director and said, we're not doing this. Parents can come in. So they masked. They took their temperatures. They social distanced. They didn't stay for more than 15 minutes. But um, but it was an, there was a feeling of normalcy where you would see people who weren't in your immediate family. So that all that all was about what does it mean to create come. Um, the next is, is honesty and transparency. And that became even deeper. It became about authenticity. So from the very start, we, we didn't have a COVID case in the center until January of 2021, which is kind of shocking. Um, but it won, but um, it was before, it was in the very early days where there weren't even tests and you called and you Told your, told your symptoms and they said, just stay home for 14 days and don't come to an emergency room unless you can't breathe. So it, right. it was COVID, but you know, no one, no one was calling it anything. So we closed for one day, we did a deep cleaning and we were open again. So we didn't have the quarantines until 2021. Um, but throughout, there were a lot of programs that were bragging. We haven't had um, a case yet. And from the start, I had said, um, it's, it's not if, it's when, and it's right. nobody's fault, and there will be no shame and no blame. And so when anyone would ask, programs were, were boasting at the time, no COVID cases here, and we were not. So if somebody said, have you had a COVID case? We would say, not yet, but we could in the next five minutes. We don't know. Right. So, And then whenever anything mm -hmm. happened, an exposure, uh, uh, whatever might happen, it was quick telling everything. That was with parents coming in. I don't tell you my protocol. You can come in and see it. And whatever happened, whatever challenges, there was never any sweeping under the rug, whether that was right. first issue, staff issues, it, it was transparency. And that went deeper to being transparent with ourselves about who we are and where we're living up to our, our own ideals and where we're not. So that, that's that been very powerful for us. And then the last was play, is when all else fails, play. And mm -hmm. we'll be working on the education. That will all come. Um, but we became much more deeply ingrained as a play-based program and a program that leads with play and play from the play, everything else emerges. And that, that's amazing. And that, this is all like, this is not what you intended at the beginning, but this is what it's all transformed to as you're going through that process. Right. And I, I really appreciate that because I think, I think sometimes when we have visions in schools and our classrooms, uh, no matter what changes around us, we, we just stick to it. And I, I've always said that visions for vision and mission statements in schools and districts should be written on Google Docs. It yes. should be something that you can modify as you need and adjust, right? Because I think sometimes we see that the vision is no longer necessarily, not maybe not relevant is the best word, but not as applicable as it, as it once was. And part of it is like not only when it was created, but by who it was created. But then as things change, do we learn to adjust? Do we actually uh, connect? And that's something that I think is is really powerful. And so let's talk, let's talk a little bit about um, your book, Havens of Hope. And I know a lot of the stuff that you talked about is probably in this book already that you just shared. And it, it's really nice because I, I I love that you're, you can see that you're living it. You're not just talking about this stuff, right? And you're yes. putting it into practice. So tell us, like, tell us some of the, like, maybe some of the, maybe one or two of the strategies that you share. Uh, in the book about to kind of help people as, as they're kind of 
maybe making a shift or trying something different in their own educational practice. Absolutely. So the book um, actually doesn't give strategies. It's okay. not a how to, it's more of a why, a, mm -hmm. a, a what and a why. Um, since I've developed more of the strategies and the how to's that, that the book ends with the next chapter is, is up to us. We can do with this, whatever we choose Right. We changed because we had to now, what do we do? Because we choose to, but what's at the essence of the book is that when we, when we're highly, um, engaged in being responsive to what's happening around us yeah. and in the relationships of those around us, everything else follows. So being responsive, being attuned, facing what was happening and um, discovering what the next right steps were. And so there were, there were four different ways that COVID transformed the, pe the stories, the people who were highlighted in the stories in the book. One was COVID was a catalyst and led them in directions they never would have considered before. Mm -hmm. And that included starting schools when they had no intent or thought about starting a school. So some of the new schools that popped up were not being dreamed about for years. They happened um, or real transformations of schools. So there was a catalyst. Um, there was an accelerator. for So for some, they were already on a path that they believed in. And with COVID, it just supercharged it. They were just able to say, we are going for this full, full throttle. So that happened with a number of the outdoor programs that wanted to move more into nature. And now with COVID, mm -hmm. uh, there was so much reason to be outside. Right. And they got support and they pushed it. So there was acceleration of visions. There was an anchor. So there were programs that became far more anchored in who they always were and what they believed. And that gave them strength. And, um, and it, and they had evidence that what they were doing was effective. That was some of the project-based schools that were being able to be really flexible in learning when learning had to become more flexible. Um, and then there was the sculpting. And, and that's kind of where the book ends, of sculpting down to the essence of what you believe so that you can then rebuild in all kinds of ways without ever losing the essence. And that's what's emerged in a lot of the trainings that I've done since, which is more than not having a vision, a mission, a core value statement that remains in stone, um, having mm -hmm. just a line, just one line, what is most important to you? So, uh, and, and, and that's not new. That was done, Reggio Inspire, Reggio Learning, um, founded right after World War II, Northern Italy, was about standing against oppression, injustice, and equity. Mm -hmm. Waldorf Learning, founded in Germany right after World War I, that was about revitalization, not only through the political and the economic, but through the spiritual, the social, emotional, the artistic, um, believing that that was a way to combat the, the devastation Germany faced. Um, and Montessori, earlier in the 20th century, um, which started being about independence and living independently when that was the way to move forward in a, in a place that was opening up economically, but with a lot of inequity mm -hmm. and then later extended to a focus on peace through two world wars and really believing that promoting world peace started with peaceful classrooms. So these are programs that were warriors for world changing beliefs and implemented that through relationships and through approaches to learning. So it, it translated in the micro into every interaction, not every interaction, but as close as they could mm -hmm. get between a teacher and a child, and then um, was contributing towards changing the field and changing the world. And we have the opportunity to do that now. And there are programs that are, and that is a narrative happening in, a, in education as much as there's another narrative about how much we've suffered and how hard it is and how burnt out we are, which is, is all true. Right. Uh, it's also true that we have the opportunity to create something new and meaningful. So I got to ask you this last question. So the, the book is titled Havens of Hope, Ideas for Redesigning Education from the COVID-19 Pandemic. How do you define the word hope? What a great question. Hope is active. Hope mm -hmm. is creative. Hope is behaving in a way that creates the future that you want 
today. And that's what these programs did in their own small worlds. They created the environment that they wanted that didn't exist in the outside world and then worked to start to spread it. When you walk into these programs, you felt a lightness and a joy and a creativity when the outside world felt so heavy and frightening. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, I think that's why I wanted to ask you this is because, and I really appreciate how you kind of articulated this is that the idea of like, you know, Oh, I hope I could win a million dollars. And it's like, you just hope some, like something will just hit you in the head, like an asteroid, you know, bringing you a million dollars. Whereas I see hope is, as you said, you know, something more active, something that you actually create. Right. Like I, I hope I can build this. Right. And so there is that hope there is that kind of vision, but it's, there, there, I think there's a difference between that idea of like just hoping but not doing anything versus hoping and actually moving toward that vision, right? And I think that's that's why I really appreciate what, what you're sharing. Yeah, absolutely. And I questioned that. And at one point asked the publisher if maybe we should have a different title and they, they love the title. And I, I love the title as well. Hmm. Uh, yet, yes, I totally agree with you. Uh, hope can't be past. Hope can be. It can be whatever you call it. But right. for me, hope is not passive. Hope is actively in the ways that you can designing what you want to see in the world. And you don't need permission for that. Anybody, wherever they are with what they have, with what they can do, can bring their vision in mm. the micro interactions, even if uh, they're in a world that a system that feels somewhat oppressive, um, feels like they're not getting their vision, you, everybody can discover their vision within them and live that vision in, even in small ways, because the small ways are the big ways. Yeah. And it's kind of like the, the difference between, I hope for a better world versus I hope we can create a better world, right? Like there's, there's, something, there's something there too. So, uh, Dr. Shira, thank you so much for taking the time and I, I wish you the best on the release of your book. And anyone who's listening, check out Havens of Hope, Ideas for Redesigning Education from the COVID-19 Pandemic. The description uh, is, or the, the link is down below in the description. And thank you for your time. And uh, it was it was nice. I know you're busy. We could hear the kids in the background, too. So it's like, you you know, you got a million things, but you took the time to, to kind of be a part of this, too. So uh, thank you so much for being on. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much. It was great to reconnect. 